Throughout the, um, the 1990s, their reported oil reserves never deviated from 96.5 billion barrels. Each year, for the whole decade, they reported that they had exactly 96.5 billion barrels of oil. What they were saying was that each year we discover exactly the number of barrels of oil as we pump. Welcome to the Power and Market Report. I'm Albert Liu. Joined once again by Richard Mayberry, he's the president of Henry Madison Research. He's also the publisher of the Early Warning Report. You can check that out at earlywarningreport.com. Richard, thank you once again for joining me. How are you? Oh, I'm very good, and uh, I appreciate you uh, asking me to be on again, Albert. You, you do a great job here, and um, I, uh, I always enjoy listening to your show. You. you are a lot better than practically anybody else out there, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Richard. And people are always asking for you, so it's it's just an absolute pleasure to have you uh, join me once again. Uh, I'm looking at the global events, the news of the day, and we're going to get to some of the specifics. But in general, since I spoke to you last, which was uh, I, I believe it was early November or late October, we mm -hmm. have a new president-elect Trump uh, who has a lot to say, I think, about trade deals. He's talking about changing a lot of those. He's making a lot of noise uh, about possibly uh, labeling China as a currency manipulator. So you have that going on. If you look at uh, across the Atlantic, we had Brexit recently. If you look at the European continent, you have uh, some serious fractures uh, emerging now with uh, Italy uh, uh, poised to have their referendum. And then we have an, an election uh, not too far away in France. Uh, so that's problematic. We have an oil market that's very dynamic and causing uh, a lot of concern in the Mideast. The reason I mention all of this is because it seems like now would be a great time to be an expert in geopolitics and even more so to be an expert in geopolitics and to tie that to investing in a newsletter. Uh, I suspect business for you is going pretty well and if it's not it's going to be uh, going berserk in the coming year I think. Well thank you, I hope so. <laughs> These, uh, yeah, so, I, I mean, there's just so much going on. Uh, let's just start with the, the U.S. President-elect Trump. Uh, when we spoke last, uh, you basically said, really, it really doesn't matter. Both candidates, they want to be president. That's their number one priority. And so uh, you weren't leaning, uh, you know, one way or the other. Now, we got Trump, and I think uh, you've been proven right, because since he's uh, won the election, he's really bolted from a lot of his prior positions. So we had, uh, for instance, a lot of talk about prosecuting Hillary Clinton. That seems to be gone. Uh, we had a lot of talk about a wall. That's definitely softened. And uh, talk about uh, perhaps rolling back some of the environmental initiatives. That he's softened on as well. So uh, is this pretty much what you expected? Uh, absolutely, and I've got a detailed article on this coming up for the January issue of Early Warning Report. And the, the point I make, um, I, I, I use the word fascism, and I do not use it in the, the way that it's normally used. Nowadays, it's just used as an insult. You call somebody a fascist, that's an insult. But fascism, I, I use the word in its original meaning, which is, the, the, the philosophy of the ancient Roman Empire. Now, what I'm, I'm going to point out is that uh, Trump has himself in the same situation as Benito Mussolini did back in the 19-teens and 20s. Um, Mussolini had been the leader of the socialist movement in Italy, and he um, decided that socialism uh, wasn't so great after all, and he dropped out and became the um, uh, leader, you know, Il Duce of, of Italy, and found himself with no ideology to follow. He had no set of ideas to guide his decisions. And he started just making it up, and what he did was reinvent the Roman system, which is fascism. Um, and the, the, the key point in fascism is that there's actually no philosophy. It's just a simple statement 
that uh, all truth is a matter of opinion, and therefore right and wrong are just matters of opinion, and rulers should do whatever appears necessary, no exceptions, no limits. That's what fascism is. Um, and Mussolini built up the whole Italian economy and everything else based on that do-whatever-appears-necessary system. And what Trump is doing is copying Mussolini. Now, I don't know the man, so I don't know exactly how he got to this point, but I think all of this uh, waffling back and forth, uh, changing his decisions constantly, is a very clear sign the man has no real ideology except do whatever appears necessary. And investors had better pay attention to that because that means that there is no way to predict. You cannot know what the government is going to do. And you have to be ready to change instantly when he changes his mind. Um, it's a really big thing. I think this is one of the biggest things ever to happen in America. And it's not recognized yet for what it really is. And again, I'm not using the word fascism as an insult. I'm using it the way it was originally intended, which is the philosophy of the ancient Roman Empire. Not the, the Roman Republic, but the Roman Empire. And that philosophy was do whatever appears necessary. And uh, Richard, I, th I think we've, we've sort of had this philosophy in this country for some time now, but I think what's changed is that Trump sort of has the latitude to actually do what you're saying and uh, switch back and mm -hmm. forth and do whatever he feels is necessary and actually get away with it. I don't think Obama had quite that much leeway. I don't think Bush had quite that much leeway, uh, but Trump with with this huge victory and so much dissatisfaction in the country uh people seem ready to embrace something like this yes right uh, um yeah you're right this isn't new in america actually fascism was or the, the logic of fascism uh under underlied if that's the right word <laughs> it, it was the foundation of Re president roosevelt's new deal just do whatever appears necessary and um, it was extremely popular, and it was extremely popular all over a good part of the world. A huge part of Europe just fell in love with this idea and ran away with it. Um, and Hitler built Nazism on top of Mussolini's logic. All truth is a matter of opinion. Just do whatever appears necessary. And, uh, again, I, I mean, you're right. I mean, Trump is so um, powerful, I guess that's the word, uh, that, that he's going to follow this trail for quite a while, probably, before something really awful develops from it. Um, but that actually makes me very optimistic, because we, we're witnessing now the death of, of the socialist ideology. Uh, the Soviet Union came down, and now... Uh, Western Europe is coming down, all because they follow the socialist model, which doesn't work. And there's not really any model left to try, well, except two. One would be fascism, and the other one is the, to return to the system of liberty. And I think that we're going to have some two or three years of uh, really nasty stuff from the fascism, and then there's only going to be one thing left to try and that is to go back to the system of liberty. So I think we're headed in the right direction here, but we're going to have to wade through two or three years of fascism before we find people finally, as a last resort, trying liberty. So we'll have uh, a Richard Mayberry on the ticket in 2020? <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, people are always asking me if I'll run for president, but... I don't lie well enough. There's no way I could win. You know, I wonder if you, if you take any uh, comfort in the fact that since Trump has been elected, he's kind of just slipped into sort of the, the normal role that a president would play, meaning he's, he's not draining the swamp, he's swimming in it. Uh, the <laughs> cabinet positions that he's proposing, you, you hear names like Romney, Giuliani, Petraeus, uh, he's got a Goldman Sachs guy uh, going, to, uh, you know, uh, to be the Secretary of the Treasury. Nothing's changed, uh, and things weren't great before, but they're certainly much better than the picture that you just painted for us. So, is this good news? Uh, is this what? Is this good news? Um, yeah, I, th I think um, 
especially for investors, um, we're in a situation here where uh, obviously there's a, a big surge of optimism since the election, and that's probably going to continue for quite a while, not as it did under Mussolini. I mean, he came into power promising to make the trains run on time, and he actually did make the trains run on time. And so there was a, a big euphoria in Italy for quite a while that this guy actually was making things work. And that produced you know, a huge number of opportunities. And it will do the same thing in the United States. There's, there's going to be a lot of money made on the opportunities that the things, from the things that, that Trump is going to do. And we should go out there and earn that money because it isn't going to last forever. <laughs> um, he's going to... He's going to be changing his mind enough that eventually people will, will catch on to the fact that they cannot plan ahead. And um, everything has to be a short-term deal or it's not going to be done. So that will be a, have a crippling effect. But it's going, to have a, it's going to take a little while for the public to, to begin to understand that, that they can no longer make any long-term plans. And um, I think that, you know, that's when there will be uh, another really big political crisis and the country will be left without options except for the system of liberty. Uh, Richard, I want to move on to global factors here shortly, but just before we do that, the U.S. stock market has been going absolutely nuts since Trump was elected. People think that a lot of this uh, fiscal stimulus, the domestic spending on construction is going to be good for the economy. Do you see opportunities for profit uh, domestically here in the United States? Oh yeah, and um, I made some suggestions on infrastructure stocks um, in the month before the election, saying that you know whichever side got elected was going to do infrastructure, and boy, you know those things have been going wild. I also suggested um, a, a possibly greater commitment to defense stocks, and those have been going well too. So you know, my readers are already proof that, of the opportunities that are going to crop up from this. Uh, he w is going to pour money into various parts of the economy that are going to benefit greatly. Uh, a, a key point uh, to keep in mind um, is that, um, well, rats, it just went away. <laughs> That's okay. Um, let's see. Um, uh, it'll come back to me in a minute, yeah, probably. I, I want to I talk about uh, some of these global factors that are developing. Uh, I know that you're, you're hot on military spending. Uh, you've recommended uh, energy stocks, oil service companies in the past. We just mm -hmm. had an OPEC meeting conclude today. This is the last day of November. I've been waiting for mm -hmm. this the result of this meeting. It looks like they're going to cut, OPEC countries are going to cut 1.2 million barrels per day. And I heard a report earlier this morning that non-OPEC countries were going to uh, kick in uh, and cut roughly 600,000 per day, somewhere around there. So it's, it's somewhere around, you know, uh, 1.8 or 2 million per day cut. That is going to bring the, the price up. And what I wanted to talk to you about is the situation that uh, the Saudi kingdom finds itself in. They were the big movers behind this deal. It looks like they're bordering on desperation is actually what made it happen because they need the price higher. They're planning to IPO their oil assets next year and they have a major budget crisis as well. Can you talk about what's going on in the Saudi Kingdom and how it relates to global politics? Okay, let's first look at that agreement. Um, it's my contention that there is no agreement. There is a public statement by these governments, but these governments are governments and governments lie and they are notorious liars over there um, they not only lie to their own populations they lie to each other too and the proof of that is in their reserve statistics uh, year after year they are required each government is required in the OPEC organization to report how much oil reserve they have in the ground and um, those numbers, if you look back at them over the last 30 years or so, you find they make no sense. 
the numbers are insane. And an example is um, Kuwait's reporting. Uh, for throughout the um, the 1990s, their reported oil reserves never deviated from 96.5 billion barrels. Each year, for the whole decade, they reported that they had exactly 96.5 billion barrels of oil. What they were saying was that each year we pump, or each year, rather, we discover exactly the number of barrels of oil as we pump, year after year after year. Well, now, it had to be a lie. You know, there's no possible way that could be true. And and yet they kept reporting it year after year after year. And I think that was the Kuwaiti rulers just quietly telling the whole world, these agreements that we make are nonsense because they're pumping uh, permission was based on how many barrels of oil they had. And you had other cases where, uh, for instance, the Iranian government uh, just in one from one year to the next, they uh, they increased their uh, reported reserves by something like 50%. So they were saying that they found that much oil in one year. It couldn't be. It's just in it, physically impossible to do. So um, this is not an agreement. You know, it's a better way to look at it is, is uh, what can be the value of an agreement among a group of liars. And... So, so don't take these these numbers as being any anything as being any indication of what's actually going to happen. It could be they'll stick to those numbers for ten minutes or twenty minutes or something like that, but they will stab each other in the back. They always have, and I think it's a good bet they always will. Now, as far as the Saudis are concerned, <clears throat> you're right. I they are. Uh, you know, back in the 70s when they were running the, <laughs> practically the whole world because they had a near monopoly on, on oil and they had the ability to control the price, um, that was a whole different situation than it is now because they were a whole different country than they were then. Um, they, they uh, at that time, were still very primitive, and um, they were in the position of realizing that that the Saudi tribe had conquered all these other tribes of Saudi Arabia, and those tribes weren't real happy about being conquered, and they needed to be bought off. And so the Saudi tribes started taking the oil money and, and creating this enormous welfare state where the whole country was just essentially bought off um, to, pre- to prevent them from rising up. Well, now they're in a position where they've got, you know, a couple generations of people in Saudi Arabia who are accustomed to, to that largesse, and um, they have to keep it going. If they don't find a way to keep that welfare, welfare state going, they're going to have a revolution. So uh, they are desperate, and, and yes, they need to pump more oil, and they need to get more money for it, and whether they can get enough or not is really problematical. So um, this agreement that we're watching here now, um, the simple fact that they're going through the motions here uh, when they almost certainly don't intend to actually follow the agreement, it's like they're trying to buy time. Uh, They don't know what else to do. They've got a population that is a bunch of welfare cases that are are going to get violent if they don't keep the welfare state going. And they've really kind of run out of ways to do that. So I don't know what's coming, but everybody's always known that the Persian Gulf was a powder keg, and it is more so now than ever before. Um, And uh, I think that I wish I could could give you some timing on this, but I can't. But uh, I, I think it's just pretty much inevitable that there's going to be some sort of colossal disaster over there. Uh, it's going to be very violent, and it's going to drive oil up, um, I, I think, you know, at least $300 a barrel. Again, I wish I could say when. All I know is that the condition of, conditions are, are right for it. 
Right? And that's so many great points there, Richard. I think the key point is that they not only lie to us, but they lie and cheat each other within the cartel. Uh, I would also add, though, the significance of non-cartel oil producers these days with uh, Russia and then you have the U.S. shale. They have that to contend with as well. And then finally, the irony of your last statement that uh, when this whole thing blows over, we may have oil, uh, I forget what you said, $300 or $100 a barrel. All they're trying to do now is to push it up to you know, the high 50s or 60. And their failure to do that is going to implode the whole thing. Uh, but yeah. I want to talk about a different type of reserve, and that's central bank reserves, because the Saudi budget is a big issue now. So in the, I think it was the 2015 or 2016 budget, they predicted a deficit of, of almost 90 billion U.S. dollars. And if you look at that against their central bank reserves, you're looking at roughly five years of a, of, of a fiscal buffer, after mm -hmm. which... Uh, some of the things that you were talking about are, are could be in play. Uh, yes, and, and again, um, if these people will lie about their oil, they'll lie about anything else. And so the reported financial situation uh, is probably a myth, too. Um, I, I think practically everything <laughs> over there <laughs> is just cooked up um, for public consumption. And, and they don't feel any particular uh, need to tell the truth to anybody. So, uh, and, and I can, you know, understanding their history, I know a lot of their history, and I know how they were treated by the Europeans, and so I'd probably feel that way too um, if I had been, you know, treated that way. So this, the idea that we understand what the real situation is in the Persian Gulf is a very dangerous idea because I don't think we do. And in, in fact, if you look at the the reported world oil reserves all around the world, um, in in every country that has oil, um, what you find is that about ninety percent of the world's oil is in the hands of governments, and governments are professional liars. So we don't really know who has what anywhere in the world. And my, my guess is, knowing how governments behave, my guess is world oil reserves, oil and gas reserves, aren't anywhere close to what the markets are assuming they are. Because these traders, for some reason, they want to believe what these governments say. There's, there's no evidence that these governments are honest, but traders tend to believe the statistics. And the statistics... Are, are undoubtedly painting a picture that is wildly optimistic. Richard, you know what strikes me as you explain all this is uh, it seems like most of the investment world only believes that maybe the Chinese and the North Koreans lie about their numbers. If the number <laughs> comes out of China, people will be, uh, I think, for good reason, skeptical. Yet, mm -hmm. on the other hand, you have these traders willing to accept these numbers regarding oil, gold, uh, bank reserves, and, and other figures, you know, our own numbers here in the U.S., uh, mm -hmm. so willing to accept those at face value. I find that funny. Yeah, right. And, and it comes from the fact, I think mostly, is it, during the 20th century, um, the whole world went from uh, children being raised by their parents to children being raised in schools that are owned or controlled by government agencies. That's a, that's a new thing in, wor in world history, in, in human history, that children are raised in schools owned or controlled by government agencies. And so what everybody grows up being taught is that whenever there's a problem, the solution is more government. And so you know, children come out of school believing that governments um, have some sort of special morality or ethics or something that makes them honest, and then you can believe their numbers, and you can believe whatever else they say. And it's ridiculous, you know. History shows exactly the opposite. The most crooked organizations <laughs> ever to walk the planet are governments. It's always been that way, and it's still that way today. 
But everybody's been taught that governments are honest, and they believe these numbers for that reason. And I think there's a, a great big nasty awakening coming, coming somewhere down the road. Richard, we're running out of time, so I, I want to get your thoughts. I know you said that you like construction uh, and military spending here at home. Uh, what are your thoughts on oil? What's the best uh, way to get exposure to oil? It sounds like you're looking for it to go up quite a bit. Yeah, um, I don't know. You know, at the moment, the, they've all made some nice moves, and I'm not prepared to pick a, a new one right now. Um, but I, I think a better uh, better buy at the moment generally is, is raw materials in general. And uh, you might go for uh, BHP, uh, BHP Billiton, uh, or Rio Tinto on either one of those because they're diversified raw materials producers. The raw materials haven't moved yet uh, because you know, practically everything else has, and they've been the laggards because they always are going to be. Um, you don't buy into the raw materials unless you're sure that there's going to be a lot more manufacturing going on. So I think um, when this boom finally trickles down to that basic manufacturing level, then at that point you'll see raw materials starting to take off. So to my mind, raw materials, and, and that includes uh, the precious metals, gold, silver, platinum, and palladium, I think they are still the best bargains that are out there, and I would point people in that direction. All right. Thank you very much, Richard. Always enjoy talking with you and can't mm -hmm. wait to get you back on for another discussion. Okay. Yeah, I'll look forward to it. I've been speaking with Richard Mayberry. He's the publisher of Early Warning Report. Please check him out at earlywarningreport.com. And don't forget to visit powerandmarket.com for insightful interviews with the world's leading experts in economics, finance, and investing. Until next time, take care. Hi, I'm Albert Liu, host of the Power and Market Report. If you enjoyed this video, I invite you to subscribe to my channel by clicking the button on the top left uh, of the screen. And don't forget, you can also visit us on Facebook and at powerandmarket.com. Thanks again for watching.